we could we could look at the, the way that a lot of freedom lovers see history and kind of break it into two basic approaches. Uh, one is to see liberty as constantly in decline. And a lot of people kind of see this. They say, we used to be a free country. The government got really big, especially in the 20th century. It got bigger during the Progressive Era and the New Deal and the Great Society. And now it's bigger than ever. And our liberty has shrunk to a historical low. And while I don't want to say that there's no truth to any of what this approach uh, says, uh, there's at least another side of the story. Writing in the mid-60s, Murray Rothbard penned an essay called Left and Right, The Prospects for Liberty. And he noted that a lot of liberty lovers were taken in by what he saw was an error in seeing history in these terms, uh, particularly uh, a way that conservatives tended to see uh, the, the trajectory of liberty. As he points out in that essay, in the very beginning, the conservative has long been identified with a long-term pessimism and a short-term optimism, or at least a, a fixation on the short term. Seeing the, the hope for humanity as doomed in the long run, conservatives are often really pent up about the next election, the next war with a communist state, the next showdown for liberty, because the short term is all that matters. And you see this in politics, where the defeat of Obama or the hoped defeat of Obama was seen as really the, what, what like everything came down to. You know, We have to beat him or else everything is doomed forever. And they didn't beat him, and we'll hear them say it again in four years. Every presidential election is the most important ever. But he says that liberty lovers need to reclaim an appreciation of the classical liberal tradition, which he says guides us toward a short-term pessimism and a long-term optimism. He identifies that for much of history, liberty was simply non-existent. The concept of liberty was basically non-existent. And up through, up until the Enlightenment, the norm for most people was, li was to live su subjugated under the constraints of the old order. Mercantilism, feudalism, serfdom, monarchism, uh, you know, state-enforced patriarchy, tribalism, warfareism. The old ancien regime of the consolidation of throne and altar. Power of a conservative nature was the enemy of liberty, historically anyway. And Rothbard argues that what happened in the late 19th century and early 20th century was that liberalism, which long saw itself as the ideology of the masses, of the workers, of the people, against the forces of conservative authority, against the old style collusion between business interests and the state. That liberalism used to embrace industrialization for the masses. It used to embrace liberty and free trade and the freedom to enter into businesses and to break down monopolies through freedom. He says that this liberalism got distorted and twisted by a number of factors. One, a complacency. Because liberals, going back for a couple hundred years, had viewed the natural course of history as one of progress, many of them became complacent because they said, well, progress is coming. We might as well, in a sense, just kind of make peace with the establishment or just tolerate the state. Eventually, we'll be freer anyway. And he also identified utilitarianism as 
a corrupting influence on liberalism. This belief that what matters, as John Stuart Mill might put it, was the greatest good for the greatest number. And as long as that seemed to get better and better, there wasn't this urgency that the natural rights tradition gives us. This urgency that we must go to the barricades to fight for justice because it's wrong, it's wrong for individuals to be oppressed no matter how few their number. And the perversion of liberalism was seen in the United States in the form of progressivism, this belief that instead of liberating humanity from the shackles of the oppressor, we could make a deal with the state and use the state to elevate the poor, to even out the wrinkles in the economy, to make the market fairer. And in a much more pronounced, radical sense, we see this perversion in Marxism, where Marx took the way liberals divided society into classes, you know, the oppressed and the oppressors, the taxpayers and those that fed off the tax revenues. And he distorted this by introducing profit as the major factor in determining whether you were oppressed or oppressor. And the state, of all things, as the key to liberating humanity. It, it, before the late 19th century, the idea that the state was on the side of the workers against business, big business, it just didn't make sense because it was never that way. And it still isn't that way, really. You know, This idea that you know, the Occupy Wall Street people, we are the 99%, half these people at least seem to think Obama's one of the 99% too. When Obama got you know, more campaign contributions from Goldman Sachs in his first run than any of the other candidates, and currently maintains the most powerful state in world history. He has the power to just kill anyone, go to war with anyone. As my friend Charles Johnson says, once you have nuclear weapons, you're no longer in the 99%. <laughs> but this idea that the state is what's protecting us people from the privileged and powerful, if you think about it, it's just crazy on its face. The state is the privileged and powerful. You can't, the, the, uh, when the underdog overtakes the state against the ruling class, it becomes the ruling class. But much more often, the ruling class never changes much. That revolving door between Wall Street and the government is moving as fast as ever. Applying this long-term approach to liberty, this idea that there were huge triumphs of liberty that we take for granted because we've already benefited from them, we could look at American history. We are tempted to look at early American history as some paragon of freedom. And in terms of the size of the central state, in terms of what the average free person expected of government, there's truth to this. And we can learn a lot by looking at early American history and the areas where the state was not involved. On the other hand, it wasn't really that ideal. It was a free country if you were a white male property owner of the proper religion. But most people weren't. Back then, about half the people were women. And they weren't free. And a lot of people were slaves or indentured servants or religious minorities. <clears throat> I mean, it's sometimes a problem where you see freedom lovers talk about how America used to be free, oh, except for that slavery thing. But slavery wasn't just this asterisk. It's true there were some places relatively untouched by it. A lot of people. You could see some people that seemed freer than people are today. But by the eve of the Civil War, there were four million people who were chattel slaves in the United States. Some states in the South, it was close to a majority. I think in South Carolina, it was a majority. The population were black and slaves. And slavery wasn't just this minor deviation from the ideal. It was a total deviation. And it permeated the political economy. It led to sexual, sectional conflict. It, it, 
it totally messed up freedom even for whites. Poor whites were forced onto these slave patrols to enforce slavery as part of their militia service. And it was not a free market for those people, to say the least. Peter Colchin says in his great book, American Slavery, uh, one of the best uh, summations of American slavery, slaves could hardly turn around without being told what to do. They live by rules, sometimes carefully constructed and formally spelled out, and sometimes haphazardly conceived and erratically imposed. Rules told them when to rise in the morning, when to go to the fields, when to break for meals, how long and how much to work, and when to go to bed. Rules also dictated a broad range of activities that were forbidden without special permission, from leaving home to getting married. And rules allowed or did not allow a host of privileges, including the right to raise vegetables and garden plots, trade for small luxuries, hunt and visit neighbors. Of course, all societies impose rules on their inhabitants in the form of laws. But the rules that bound slaves were unusually detailed, covered matters mostly normally untouched by law, and were arbitrarily imposed and enforced, not by an abstract entity that, at least in theory, represented their interests, but by their owners. Slaves lived with their government. I'm glad that there's a sense in which I don't live with my government. The, the government is there, it's taxing me, but at least right now, though this is early in the NSA surveillance era, it's not quite there. You know, it was free except for the slaves. It was free except for the American Indians, most of whom didn't really favor the efforts at American independence because they didn't see the point. And they were, you know, put on to these, these plots of land and moved around and displaced and humiliated and massacred. This, this country used to have a lot of these people and now they're virtually all gone. They still live on reservations, those that, many of those that have survived. And women, women lived uh, under coverture laws until, uh, depending on the state, all the way up into the late 19th century where women couldn't own property if they were married, for example. So it's, it seems like it's, it's more than an asterisk, it's more than a minor detail when you're talking about half the people. Now even if it's just a minority that's being oppressed, we, we need to care about that. But women are a peculiar minority because they're half the people. And then you add in all the other oppressed groups, religious groups, certain ethnic groups. And things have been worse in this country. It wasn't until after the Civil War that the abolition of chattel slavery had come to be perhaps the greatest triumph for liberty in American history. But then we had Reconstruction, where the U.S. government maintained these military uh, territories. They divided the South up into military districts and ruled through military law uh, for, for, for Reconstruction. Meanwhile, the states had uh, the southern states, many of them, had, had they passed black codes to try to bring back slavery by another name, vagrancy laws that forced free men, free blacks, to uh, go to prison or to, to, to work if, if they didn't have a job. Uh, the, it, was, it was a terrible period for a lot of people. And so moving past that era, well into the 20th century, one wonders what the good old days were. Were they the good old days of Woodrow Wilson, who would have certainly, uh, if he knew anything about me, put me in jail. Franklin Roosevelt, who, if he confused me for being Japanese, would have put me in an internment camp. Or Harry Truman, who also oversaw a, a lot of uh, horrendous government policies. It was not a free country in, in a lot of respects. And, and of course, oh yeah, there was Jim Crow up until the 60s. You know, a degree in the South of, of humiliation of blacks that's kind of hard to understand because you look at the literature and there's not much of a prevailing theme except 
this theme of just trying to subjugate people. And I mean, this was the reality. So when I think of the golden era of liberty, if I think, do I want to go back in time? Well, yeah, maybe the 1890s, though I might be confused for an American Indian. In California, they'd probably confuse me for Chinese. And if you were Chinese in the late uh, 19th century in California, early 20th century, there were all kinds of onerous rules. There was the first immigration controls were passed against the Chinese, and the first drug laws, too, um, to stamp out opium. But, but maybe the 1890s, you know, after slavery, but before the 20th century, there were some aspects where it was better than now. I, I don't, don't disagree. A lot of people lived lives that seem very free compared to what we get to, but a lot of people didn't. And after that, I mean, well, what's the golden era? I mean, if I took, I wouldn't go in that time machine, because what if it dropped me off in like, you know, 1943 Alabama? I'd be in the middle of the war effort, there'd be conscription, there'd be Jim Crow, it'd be pretty bad. And then, of course, until, well, at least from World War II through the 70s, we had the draft, which is what I say to men because they say, well, yeah, you argue women are in many cases uh, freer or at least more equal than they used to be, but what about men? Well, men don't, ha don't have to, uh, they're not forced to go to war I unless they've, they've signed up voluntarily. Now, we still have selective service, which I consider awful, but we don't have the systematic draft. So this transformation of liberalism into its opposite, combined with the leftover kind of old-fashioned tyranny, made for a somewhat disturbing 20th century. And now we have the War on Terror era, Terra era. We have the uh, post-financial collapse era. We have spending as a percentage of GDP higher than it's ever been since World War II, and it's not sustainable with these deficits. And we have this. This is a picture of the ideal of the panopticon, where they, they can see all, except today's panopticon is everywhere. It's not, they don't have to put you somewhere. They can just follow you around. <laughs> Your smartphone, they can uh, listen in if they want. They can, even if you turn it off, they can turn it on and listen to you. So it's, it's a troubling time. And so what I've been thinking about lately is I've been balancing this idea. Is has it gotten freer? Has it gotten less free? Well, it really depends. But I think we're back at a kind of time that we were in the 19th century when liberalism became corrupt by becoming complacent. I know a lot of people who love freedom who point out correctly that there have been worse times. And for a lot of demographic groups in the United States, there's no time much before now that was even tolerable in the least. But I fear, and this is a new fear that I've, that I've adopted just in the last few months, that the new generations are losing sight, and so I'll sound more like a conservative now, of what has been lost, particularly with surveillance, with policing, with certain presidential powers. And so it sounds kind of nihilistic to say, you know, there's some like magical law of the conservation of tyranny here where, you know, you can only have so much freedom for so many people. I don't think that. I think that in the long term, we are going to be freer. But my hope isn't in the short term. There's always some hope in the short term, but my hope isn't that in the short term something will happen and then we'll go back to the good old days of 2007 or whatever the Republicans think we should strive for. Those weren't the good old days, right? Martial law was, something like martial law was used after Hurricane Katrina, you know? We had more torture even than today. We had national security letters and most of what Obama's doing that's so terrible had precursors in Bush, including the stimulus and including the bailouts. So my hope can't be with the short term, not the immediate short term. 
At the end of Rothbard's essay, he quotes Randolph Bourne, who I cited last lecture about war as the health of the state. And this is something Randolph Bourne said that I think is really cool. Youth is the incarnation of reason pitted against the rigidity of tradition. Youth puts the remorseless questions to everything that is old and established. Why? What is this thing good for? And when it gets the mumbled, evasive answers of the offenders, it applies its own fresh, clean spirit of reason to institutions, customs, and ideas. And finding them stupid, inane, or poisonous turns instinctively to overthrow them and build in their place the things with which its visions team. I think the hope is always in the youth. It seems categorically true to me because if things go as they're supposed to, the younger you are, the more time left around here you have, right? That's just the way it works. But a lot of people who claim they believe in free enterprise or free markets, they have no interest in really listening to the young or even teaching them what they think they know. And so this is a lot of pressure, but I do still have hope. And you're my hope. You know, it, it is a lot of pressure. I, I encourage you to learn more about freedom and to, to come back to me and teach me things I don't know and to go around and, and speak up and, 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 and be that, that youthful spirit that questions what's there. You know, sometimes there's a good reason for something that's been there a long time, but sometimes there's not. And this is true of most of the institutions of government. And so, although it's true that, you know, a lot of you probably barely remember what it was like to live in a country where you could go to the airport and just get on a plane with very little hassle, you can imagine what it's like. And as these new progressive, seemingly modernist evils become entrenched, they become the new normal. And today's conservatives who decry what the liberals of today propose You'll notice in five years, they'll defend it. They'll be the loudest critics of the idea of cutting Social Security or Medicare. The same crowd that 50 years ago criticized these proposals. But you all can just look at it with, with new eyes and question these established and in many cases harmful institutions and practices. And I'll tell you, when I was in high school, there were a lot fewer people in this country interested in liberty. And so when people, older libertarians or lovers of freedom, told me that, you know, you're our hope, that was just awful to hear because I had said, you know, I don't think I want to be that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm interested in this stuff, I'll keep thinking about this stuff, but I kind of wanted to play music or write or, or do something else, right? Maybe I want to be an actor. And it was a lot of pressure. Oh, you're our hope. Me, I'd look around and everyone at these, these events would be old and older. And it looked like the movement for liberty was dying of age. <laughs> but in the last like five years, things have changed. In the last five, seven years. And I've seen this huge growth of the youth movement. So it sounds like a lot of pressure, but it's distributed, you know? There's, there's, there's 12 of you right here right now. So you can divide it up. And if some of you don't want to want to have any interest in this or then that's okay too, you know, you should do what you want. But for the rest of you, although it might be a lot of pressure, please help redeem, help vindicate the the vision of long term optimism for the future of liberty. And please keep learning and teaching and speaking out. <laughs>